So to paraphrase Stephen Jay Gould, paintings and drawings are not just frills or summaries. Paintings and drawings are foci for modes of thought. Throughout human history, people have always used art to capture the essence of nature and its denizens. And centuries ago, when science was born as a philosophy and discipline, art and language together were used to represent nature. Paintings, drawings, and illustrations were quite literal, as is evident in the work of many artists and scholars, from da Vinci to Audubon. During the Industrial Revolution, though, the longstanding relationship between art and science faced some challenges. For example, with the onset of photography, many predicted the demise of painting and drawing, not just in the sciences, frankly, but in culture writ large. But thankfully, that did not happen. Paintings, drawing, and illustration continued to feature in the exploration of the natural world. Paleontologists, as an example, uh, could not turn to photography to represent the fantastical creatures of Earth's past. So they, among many others, including naturalists and geologists, uh, wholeheartedly embraced artists who could depict life on early Earth, for example, from its very origins to the demise of the dinosaurs. But today we are witnessing a rekindling of the arts among the sciences. Artists, now more than ever in recent history, are working alongside scientists on land and at sea. Agencies and foundations are starting to provide more support for artists to work alongside of scientists and engineers. They're talking less about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and more about STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. Not surprisingly, artists working in the field enrich the experiences of the scientists, but the fruits of their efforts go far beyond that. Their paintings and drawings capture aspects of nature that we cannot see through the lens of a microscope or via photography. Art can evoke ideas that elude words, and more often than you might think, photographs. The otherworldly glow of bioluminescence, the whimsical fairy tale-like qualities of a microbial mound, and even the sensual nature of a deep sea tube worm. Today, more than ever, artists are at liberty to use their media to express these ideas and create a deeper understanding of our own relationship to nature. Lily Simonson is at the fore of this movement and has gained recognition for her outstanding abilities as an artist and natural historian. To date, Lily has embedded herself as an artist at sea on six oceanographic expeditions and has been deployed twice to Antarctica. Her paintings have been exhibited throughout the US and Europe and her work has appeared in a range of media outlets including Interview Magazine, MTV, Atlas Obscura, Pacific Standard, the Los Angeles Times, and the LA Weekly. Lily holds a Bachelor's of Arts from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MFA in Painting from the University of California, Los Angeles, my alma mater, probably why we get along. Her art is now on exhibit here at the Museum of Natural History, and if you haven't seen it yet, you will get to do so tonight, I hope. And if you can't make it, I would strongly encourage you to come back and spend some time with them. Spending time with Lily's art, you'll see facets of these organisms and ecosystems that you really can't see anywhere else. So without any further ado, let's welcome Lily Simonson. Stage. Thank you so much, Pete, uh, for that beautiful poetic description of, of the place of uh, painting in contemporary society and about my work. And uh, hearing Pete talk, uh, you can kind of tell why he's so open to interdisciplinary collaboration. He's, he's quite, as I said, like a poet <laughs> himself. And his science is very much rooted in interdisciplinary work. Um, so instead of uh, just reading his straight bio, which he discouraged me from doing, I'll, I'll let you know that you did just hear from uh, Peter Gerges, who is a professor in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology here at Harvard. Um, and his work combines all sorts of disciplines within that field. So microbial ecology, physiology, and biogeochemistry. And he's also kind of a tinkerer, inventor, uh, uh, engineer because um, we've had a lot of limitations in measuring 
what the environment is like in the deep sea. So Pete has developed all kinds of new technologies um, to do so, and we'll describe some of this, um, some of these technologies tonight. <clears throat> so I'm going to just uh, sort of share my personal story of how I ended up um, having been trained just as a painter with no background in science, um, working directly with scientists in the field from the deep sea to Antarctica, um, and having this exhibition, which um, hopefully you can join us um, and check it out after this talk is over. Um, <clears throat> my interest actually began um, with two very different threads of, of paintings. Um, one series was, uh, I was just a, a baby artist, and the first um, real series of paintings I did was um, the much more familiar um, Maine lobster. Um, I had been making these mammoth paintings and portraits of lobsters and sort of exploring their place in art history, their relationship to the human body. I had a separate uh, body of work that was uh, just paintings of moths. So I spent many years just painting moths. And, and this is sort of the topic for a different lecture, but I'll just say they were very rooted in sort of symbolism and human ideas. Um, and that was very much where I was coming from. Uh, <clears throat> and I had thought these two series were totally unrelated. Uh, and then one day when I was in graduate school at UCLA, um, I opened my inbox and I had received uh, an article uh, from the New York Times. It had been forwarded to me by like six different friends. And uh, it described the discovery of a new creature uh, called the Yeti crab, which was uh, <clears throat> supposedly a, a lobster with the fur of a moth. So <laughs> it was like this crazy hybrid of uh, the two things that I had been painting that I had thought of as being totally disparate. Um, and it just seemed kismet, like I had to start painting it. And it's called the Yeti crab. It's got this mythological name. And it thrives at hydrothermal vents in the deep sea, so these deep sea volcanic-like uh, environments where methane and sulfur is erupting from the Earth's crust. So there are these fuzzy white crabs in this weird underworld. And I was just immediately drawn in. So I, I embarked on a series of Yeti paintings. But of course, my training is very traditional. And I like to paint from direct observation. Um, so I used to catch moths that I wanted to paint or buy lobsters at the grocery store. There was only one species in the world at this time of Yeti crab that had been collected. Uh, this is in 2006. And uh, it was at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. And so I traveled there to go see it and make drawings of it. In this photo, which I apologize for the resolution, uh, I had to um, conceal its identity because <laughs> it had just been discovered. And the scientists researching it didn't want me to share images of this Yeti crab. So I've uh, protected its anonymity. <laughs> but you can see I'm there with my sketchbook. And um, I began a long series of paintings of the Yeti. I was really interested in you know, its sort of skull-like white body and these elongated pinchers covered with this sort of mammalian fur. Um, and uh, I like to impose these sort of human narratives, these sort of romances on them. Um, but in painting this newly discovered creature, I realized that I was very much aligned with this amazing history that Pete spoke about of artists and scientists working together, or often scientists uh, like Maria Marion, uh, who was both a naturalist and a painter. Um, she actually sort of predicted the field of ecology and was one of the first people to document uh, the process of metamorphosis. Um, so she actually sold paintings to fund her expeditions to the New World. Um, <clears throat> of course, Audubon is an incredibly well-known example of that. Uh, uh, and then the Blaschkas, which um, if you're here, you're probably familiar with the uh, 
Glashkas who have, are best known for their glass flowers um, that are on display at Harvard, but they also uh, made models of marine invertebrates. So um, I began to think about how, as an artist painting something that was newly discovered, I was working in a very long, amazing tradition of using painting and drawing and in the Blaschka case sculpture to share new discoveries with audiences that wouldn't otherwise be exposed to them. But as Pete mentioned, um, today we live in a very different um, visual society and we have digital photography which has become a really amazing, efficient way of doing that, of documenting newly discovered organisms um, and sharing that widely. So I get to occupy uh, sort of a broader space and I get to not just show what these organisms look like in my paintings but actually tell more of a story um, and share an atmosphere and uh, make a sort of human uh, human interpretation of this world. <clears throat> um, I get to play with scale, so I often magnify these tiny organisms to much larger than life, sort of human scale, and in doing that, um, I invite the viewer to identify with the organism, and, and instead of just bringing these remote worlds into ours, my goal is to bring the viewer into the world of these remote alien-like creatures. <clears throat> uh, so I had been, I spent a few years just painting this Yeti crab. And uh, I, a after a certain point, I got invited to share my work at a symposium of scientists called the Census of Marine Life. And there I met uh, a scientist, Lisa Levin, who was much closer to me than the scientist in Paris I'd been working with. Uh, she was at Scripps and I was living in LA. And I started coming to her lab uh, <clears throat> and borrowing specimens. And she, she kind of encouraged me to explore other organisms in the deep sea besides just the Yeti crab. So I was reminded that there were more <laughs> organisms down there than just one. Um, so for example, this is a painting of a Riftia which um, was represented in that first slide that Pete um, was speaking about, and then some spider crabs, an isopod. Um, and again, I sort of enjoy playing with this romantic narrative. Here I envision sort of a love triangle with the isopods and <laughs> the spider. <laughs> so, um, but I'd been, I was borrowing specimens from the Scripps collection and, and using these preserved specimens as models for paintings. And after a while of, of doing that, uh, Lisa Levin, who, by the way, is a colleague of Pete's, suggested that I go to sea and actually look at these creatures as they're being collected, um, which turned out to be a total game changer. So I got to um, accompany her lab on the research vessel Melville. This is in 2012, where we were looking at creatures living in the sediment a thousand meters down and I got to see them right as they were freshly collected while they're still moving with their full pigmentation. And um, while we were on the ship, one of the members of the ship's crew had the idea that I could use the leftover sediment from the seafloor as a medium for painting. So <laughs> each day I, uh, made a painting of using that mud of an organism that we collected from the seafloor and, and sieved out. So this is a Sirachalid worm. And then the next day I would wash it off and make another painting. This is a foram. This is a, a mud owl is the common name. It's a type of worm, but it looks like an owl. This is a clam. This is a hermit crab in a scaphopod shell, an octopus, a spider crab, a brachiopod. And one thing that was really interesting about being at sea and especially making these temporary murals was um, uh, thinking about 
what I sort of was bringing to the scientists themselves. So it was great for me to have the scientists' input. You know, they would point out what features of the organism were most relevant to their research, and then I could highlight those. And you know, Lisa would come by and say, it doesn't really look like that over there. It looks <laughs> kind of like this. So that was nice for me to actually have input from experts. But I was thinking about the sort of immediacy, especially of these murals, but also with my paintings, that I could bring to them and what, what that sort of did. And I was wondering, Pete, if you might speak to that a little bit. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that uh, is always uh, fun uh, experiencing is as we're sailing uh, together, uh, it became very obvious that we are working, we sort of work on two different time domains, right? So we go out and we collect samples uh, and, you know, in many cases we archive them and a lot of our work happens here, right? Uh, at the same time, Lily is out at sea doing these studies and by the end of the expedition, Lily will have two or three paintings, uh, the sort of preconceptions done and, you know, we're thrilled because as scientists, we get to see these representations of these organisms that, that we study, but it's gonna take us three years or four years or maybe a year or two, if we're, if we're lucky, to wrap up our product. And so one of the fun things that, that tends to happen is we kind of echo off one another. And what's also cool, I imagine, Lily, is as we've talked about a little before, as we start to publish our papers, Lily gets to learn more about the organisms, and it becomes mm -hmm. kind of this feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so I feel like, it, in a way, it's kind of uh, boosts both of our morale. Like, there's something about uh, both art and science that often can be a little bit hermetic, where um, you're influencing mostly, or in dialogue, often mostly with people just within your field. So um, when I first started painting these sort of obscure organisms to meet the scientists that were studying them, it was like, wow, somebody outside of my field cares about what I do. And that's how I felt as an artist, too. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> of course, being out at sea, that sort of exchange happens constantly. Um, and so working on, yeah, I'm able to sort of produce results. And the scientists can see the fruits of their labor uh, very quickly with painting, there's an immediacy to it that you don't get with uh, research, which as Pete mentioned, you know, you'll spend a couple years writing a proposal, then a few weeks at sea gathering or in the field gathering data, and then many, many months analyzing that. And so um, to have a product um, produced on, on site in situ, I think is a really fun exchange. Um, and then those, those murals served as sort of studies for more permanent paintings. So this is an oil painting of a brachiopod based on the mud mural I made. Um, and then when I had the exhibition of my work impacted by Lisa and some of her colleagues, I invited them to come to the gallery and present their research. Um, and it was, it was kind of funny because at first I was a little, Lisa was very excited about working with me because you know, she said, oh, you can get the public interested in what we do. And in my head, I was a little like, well, I don't know if the public really cares about art either. <laughs> but I think there was something about that merging of the two disciplines that did turn out to be really engaging for people. Um, and having uh, Lisa and her colleagues come to the gallery and share their work the audience that came was very diverse and it gave them a chance to actually, as Lisa had predicted, share their research in depth with an audience that might otherwise not be exposed to it. Um, and after, after this cruise and painting, painting this deep sea um, subject matter for a couple of years, one of Lisa's students, Andrew Thurber, uh, you know, he had discovered actually a species of Yeti crab and said, but you know, my main interest is not the deep sea, it's actually Antarctica, uh, which is similar to the deep sea because there's no light for half the year. But then early spring, we dive under the sea ice to research these, these worms and other things and try and figure out how they thrive uh, without light for half the year. And when he showed me images of diving under the ice, 
I uh, was totally captivated and thought that is the most beautiful place on the planet. I have to paint it. And of course, to paint it, I have to go there. Uh, so Andrew said, well, you're in luck because the National Science Foundation actually has a program that uh, supports artists and writers along with researchers. So um, each year, along with all the scientists that go to the various research stations on the continent, they send an artist or writer to make work uh, related to that research. So I um, learned to scuba dive so that I could write a proposal to NSF to uh, spend a season in Antarctica and scuba dive under the sea ice. Um, and I ended up getting the award. So uh, I made it to Antarctica. And this is, I'll just show you some images of how it all works. So that McMurdo Sound is the largest expanse of sea ice in the world. It's covered in six feet of ice. At the beginning of the season, it, they drill holes where we plan to dive and put a hut over the hole to keep it from freezing. Um, <clears throat> and the environment underneath is just exquisite. So there's, this is me diving through the hole. Um, there's microalgae that grows in the ice itself that makes it glow this gold and neon green and turquoise color. Um, there are these amazing chandelier-like formations called brine channels. Uh, and you can see over a thousand feet. So it's the best visibility of anywhere in the world. It feels like you're not even in the water. It feels like you're flying. Uh, because when we dive, it's been dark for many months. Um, so there's nothing growing in the water. And yet there are invertebrates and sea creatures all over uh, the benthos, all along the seafloor. And then lots of seals, which I, I did get seduced into painting a seal. There we go. <laughs> My first uh, charismatic megafauna. <laughs> um, so on each dive, um, I ended up getting to dive. I thought maybe I'd dive once or twice. Um, I got to dive 25 times, actually. Um, and here I am celebrating my 25th dive in a hot dog costume, which also is the subject of a whole nother lecture. But <laughs> um, so on each dive, I would collect organisms that I wanted to paint and keep them alive in the aquarium on station. Uh, and one of the um, one of the scientists that I met there, Gretchen Hoffman, was looking at sort of the basis of the food chain there, which are these sea butterflies or pteropods. And uh, she was looking at how the changing temperature and changing ocean acidification was impacting the way they form shells. So I did a series of paintings based on those um, sea butterflies. And then they get eaten by their cousin, Limacina. Um, or sorry, Cleone, they're Limacina, that's Cleone. Cleone's common name is the sea angel. Um, and then uh, there's a whole other related food chain of other mollusks. So here are some nudibranchs in process. This is my stu uh, studio at McMurdo Station. Um, and again, these paintings are all really big scale. So this painting is four, four by four feet. Um, and that Leone painting is 16 feet long. And then I also just uh, totally fell in love with the landscape itself. Um, and I took video on all my dives of what I wanted to paint. These are pressure ridges where the sea ice gets a little bit thicker and makes these amazing cave-like formations. This is a submerged glacier. So that golf ball sort of texture is the glacier. And then the colorful part is the sea ice. And then this is actually a. Um, Methane seep, which is, they're related to hydrothermal vents. So hydrothermal vents happen uh, where there's tectonic activity and there are these dramatic plumes of mineral-rich hot fluid filled with methane um, and other minerals that come out, sort of erupt in these dramatic plumes. And then there, throughout the ocean, are these cold seeps where methane and sulfur sort of seep up slowly. And again, you get communities around them. Uh, so here are microbial mats on the seafloor. Uh, 
and then the amazing uh, brine channels and the colorful sea ice. <coughs> and um, one thing that I'll mention about my process is that I use um, UV reactive fluorescent pigments. Uh, so I do the entire painting with regular paint in white light. And then I redo the painting uh, with fluorescent paint in black light. Um, and it started because I was painting these sort of uh, these crustaceans that would really fluoresce in, in black light. So there was a sort of biological justification for it. But as I got into the Antarctic subject matter, there was just no other way to convey this sort of psychedelic, neon glowing, luminous environment under the sea ice. And uh, even when I paint deep sea organisms, it, it's become a really great way to convey the environment of being underwater and the sort of dramatic chiaroscuro of the lights of the sub or ROV illuminating this dark world. <clears throat> so I would make these paintings in Antarctica and then ship them back to my studio in California and finish them there. Um, and here are those Antarctic pieces on display at a gallery in LA. And again, for this, uh, well, for this show, I did something a little bit different. So one thing that I think is also special about painting versus other media is that, um, for example, photography and video have a sort of promise of veracity where the audience know they're, they know they're looking at something real. But one thing about painting these unfamiliar, usually unfamiliar subjects from the deep sea and from the Antarctic is that they're so fantastical. Um, and when people look at a painting, they think at first that they're looking at something that's been invented. And then there's this really exciting moment of reveal where they realize it actually exists in the natural world. Um, and so that reveal happens in different ways with my exhibitions, sometimes with wall text, sometimes when the researcher presents their work. And in this case, I really wanted people to know that this crazy neon palette I was using was real. So I had a video element for this exhibition. And then I also invited uh, <coughs> some of the scientists who I'd been working with, again, to come in and share their work. Uh, so and then here I am modeling my dive gear. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a, another really great thing that's enabled me to connect with the scientific, scientific community is in addition to me bringing researchers into the gallery to talk about their work, I've been able to speak at a lot of different scientific conferences about my work and sort of create a feedback loop where the scientists influence me and then I maybe get a chance to influence the scientists. So um, in 2014, no, 2013, I gave a talk at the Schmidt Ocean Institute Symposium, and Pete was there, and that's when we first met. And um, I explained to Pete that I really uh, loved the opportunity of going to sea for the reasons that I've mentioned, and asked him if he had any cruises coming up. And he said, yes, in fact, I do. And his lab was about to sail on the Atlantis to the East Pacific Rise which is a hydrothermal vent area <clears throat> off the coast of Mexico. And they were going to be looking at tube worms, which actually uh, was especially exciting for me because they're sort of my first deep sea love, which I had, I had almost forgotten about. I was a tube worm for Halloween in second grade. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to return to my roots <laughs> on this cruise. Um, and I had, I had painted some Riftia, but again, it had been preserved specimens. So this time, we got to, I was, got to help collect the Riftia from uh, 2,500 meters down and got to see them again while they are still living. And Pete uh, has developed an amazing way to keep deep sea animals alive, so they live at this incredible pressure. Um, and most, most scientists have struggled to run experiments on them and understand their physiology because of the incredible pressure of the deep sea. Um, but Pete, do you want to speak about the pressure van for a minute? Yeah, you know, um, 
Earlier I had mentioned uh, the uh, intersection of art and science, right? But it's equally true that science is enabled by advances in engineering. And what, what we have done over the last few years is actually, um, perhaps with a bit of irony, turn to the technologies developed for the oil and gas industry, <laughs> where they, are, they have tools that allow them to recreate the pressures that you find in the deep sea. And we've taken those and we've put them uh, in another technology developed for an entirely different purpose, and that is the refrigerated shipping container. So we have a 20-foot refrigerated shipping container that we've turned into a mobile high-pressure laboratory. And that means we're able to collect these animals and put them in these pressure vessels and keep them alive and do the studies. Now, what was really exciting about inviting Lily to participate in this was not only that she could look at animals that you know, would live for a few hours on the surface, but she could see the animals uh, through little windows she could see the animals a few days later after they've had a chance to relax and almost really kind of blossom. And so it was a really cool opportunity for Lily to work with the scientists from my laboratory um, on these animals, not just keeping them alive, but actually studying them over time. Yeah, that's another thing that I, I meant to add, too, is that um, I you know, may have initially come to painting the Yeti crab through a very deeply personal human interest, but the more I learned about how these organisms thrive, uh, the more I realized that um, the biological truths are sort of stranger than fiction. So it's really um, helpful to my process and I think makes the paintings much richer when I can actually participate in the research. So I, um, Pete's lab really encouraged me to get involved in the experiments themselves. So in addition to painting, I got to help run these physiological experiments um, and got to see tube worms alive um, over many days. Um, so this is my studio at sea. I've got my tube worm specimen and its bucket. <laughs> and here I am at the beginning stages of the painting. And then um, one of Pete's uh, former students who was at sea with us, Kiana Frank, actually um, got into my studio and documented my process. So I'll just share this video that she made. Arch a bit so I can see, yeah, and stretch, stretch out of the tube. Beautiful, yes, I want to see a little bit more blue. Yeah, just fluff up right there, magnificent. That is perfect and yeah, just twist a little so I can see more light coming through the, the tube. Excellent. Beautiful, beautiful. Don't move a muscle. That's perfect. Hate me like one of your French girls. Wonderful. Yeah. Just hold that. Oh, Lily. Don't move a muscle. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that was all Kiana, so. Um, yeah, so a lot of the scientists make their own artwork as well. <laughs> um, so this is the painting that I made actually on the Atlantis, the research vessel, um, with the live tube worms. And, and, and sort of the, obviously the joke in that video is how much I highlight the sort of fleshy human qualities of these organisms, which I think a lot of the scientists, like Kiana, think of as not very appealing, and I, I actually think they're quite beautiful. So I'm really um, highlighting this sort of figurative elements of these very alien organisms. And so what, what I, my process has become is making these, what I think of as small paintings, but are usually like three by four feet. Um, I bring them back to my studio from the ship and then use them also as a reference, along with preserved specimens, as um, they're a reference for larger paintings. So this is, um, so you can sort of see the scale of that tube worm. And this painting is on view at, at the museum right now. <clears throat> um, so this, it's, its title is Venus at Her Mirror, which I often make these sort of art historical references in my paintings. Um, and the reason I wanted to reference this specific Velasquez painting is because we used to think there was no life in the deep sea at all. Uh, there's no light, and so 
you know, we thought, oh, you need light to um, help plants grow, and plants are the basis of the food chain. And then we discovered in 1977 on a geology expedition um, to hydrothermal vents that there is a ton of life in the deep sea around these vents and also seeps. Um, and the original organism that was discovered at the vents is this tube worm, the Riftia. So um, they have a sort of iconic status in the world of oceanography. So I referenced the composition from this very iconic Venus painting um, to sort of highlight their, their iconic status. And then in this painting, I have painted also the trophosome, which is the bacteria inside the rift here. Yeah. So on that cruise, I had the chance to help dissect tube worms and see what's inside them. And they're really extraordinary. They have no mouth or gut or anus. They're just filled with um, bacteria. Am I leaving anything out, Pete? <laughs> so they take in sulfur directly from the vents and transform it into energy. And it's really quite miraculous, um, or it feels miraculous. I mean, I don't know if there are miracles. But um, this is the view of this painting in white light. And here is the view in black light. And part of the reason I do both is just so that it can be shown in, in any context. Um, and when there's white and black light on the painting, it's, it's the, sort of the best case scenario because you get this full range of color. Um, and on that cruise, there was also a group of uh, geochemists working alongside the biologists, um, led by Bill Seafried, and they were looking at the vents themselves. So, um, you have this mineral-rich fluid, which is called black smoke, but it's really just water filled with minerals uh, erupting from the seafloor, and it mixes with the cooler seawater and forms a precipitate. So it leaves behind these amazing towers uh, uh, that are just extraordinary. And I had the chance to see for the first time uh, chunks of the towers, or they call them chimneys, so Bill and his group were collecting pieces of the chimney to analyze. Uh, so I made a series of paintings of the vents themselves. So this is one of the paintings that I made at sea. And these green things are the lasers from the submarine that show the scale of, the, um, of what you're looking at. <clears throat> and then again, I used that painting that I made on the ship as a study for larger work. So here we have the vents with the black smoke coming out and then tube worms in the distance. And then I had the opportunity uh, a few months later to go out on the Atlantis again um, with Eric Cordes, who was once a postdoc in Pete's lab. Um, and so this was to look at cold seeps. And here I am uh, with the deep uh, submergence vehicle Alvin. So it's a human-operated sub. So I got to actually see um, the deep sea in situ. Um, and I am wearing a hot dog costume again here. <laughs> I did not actually get to dive in it because uh, the sub is oxygen rich. So you can't wear anything that's made of synthetic fibers and could catch fire and fuse to your skin. So <laughs> this is, I, was po I posed for this, the Alvin group wanted me to always explain to every audience <laughs> that I did not dive in the hot dog. But if I ever get the chance to dive in Alvin again, I will be bringing a wool or cotton hot dog costume. Um, and obviously, I would have dove in Alvin anywhere in the world. It would have been a, a, a total joy. Um, and, and it did transform my process to actually see these subjects in situ. However, this um, expedition happened to be to a site that is chock full of my original muse, the Yeti crab. So this was off the coast of Costa Rica. Um, and this is at a cold seep where the, this particular species of Yeti crab has a really special uh, behavior where they wave their pinchers above their bodies all the time, and it looks like they're dancing. So I had the chance to, to actually make drawings of the Yeti on the seafloor. And it was like meeting a celebrity. Like, <laughs> I, 
I got to see, I thought maybe I'd see a few, but they cluster all over. There are hundreds of them. It's really amazing. So I used the drawings that I made in the sub along with the Yetis that we got to keep alive on the ship as models for, for my painting. Uh, the tinfoil hat is, ignore that, that's an Alvin initiation thing. Um, but I tried to capture this sort of party atmosphere of the dancing Yetis. And the theory is that uh, they have this filamentous bacteria growing on their claws. And that um, bacteria is fed by sulfur. And since this species is at a cold seep rather than an event where another species live, they need to stir up and agitate the sulfur in the water to feed the bacteria on their pinchers. And then they eat the bacteria. So they're like little farmers that grow their own food on their claws. Um, and then we were also looking at uh, the cousin of Riftia, Lamella brachia. So this is a different species of tube worm. Um, whereas uh, Riftia grow super fast. How fast? <laughs> wicked fast. Very scientific, wicked fast. Uh, Lamelli grow really slowly. Um, so this one that I'm holding is probably 200 years old. But they both end up at about um, six or seven feet long. Um, and then I, again, used those paintings uh, that I made on the ship as a reference for larger paintings. Uh, so this is also on display um, at the museum. This is five by seven feet. And I tried to capture the sort of party atmosphere of the dan dancing Yeti. Um, and one of the most surprising things about diving in the sub was going through the twilight zone where there's no light, you're th going through the water column, and there is just so much bioluminescence in the water. I had no idea. Um, it turns out that 80 to 90% of deep sea creatures make their own light. So I had been familiar with the sort of particles on the surface that you see sometimes that glow. But um, diving in the sub, you see just a huge range of glowing creatures of all shapes and sizes. So this painting that's also in the show at the museum depicts some of the organisms that I painted, I, I mean, that I saw. <coughs> and I had to sort of recreate this. I didn't have specimens, but I had a lot of help from um, scientists that I always try to thank. So Edie Witter, Steve Haddock, and Brennan Phillips all study bioluminescence. And so I got to reach out to those experts and say, I saw this shape. What do you think that was? So, was that a siphonophore? Was that a copepod? Um, so I, I have to thank them for their help with this painting since I didn't have my usual models. Uh, and then I got to go back to sea with um, Pete. So um, Pete and his lab have developed a new uh, technology or a new instrument called the abyss. Do you want to just explain what that is? Sure. So one of our challenges in studying the deep ocean is that we go with a ship and we'll dive down there and we'll study it for a, a short period of time, days, weeks maybe, and we leave. And then we come back a year later, the same spot, and maybe do the same thing. And we try to stitch together an understanding of this environment from these infrequent visits. With this particular technology, which was nicknamed the abyss, the one and only interesting acronym I have ever come up with, uh, it, uh, it's a tool that allows us to take the, me the, the technologies we have in the laboratory, the gas sensors and the water samplers and all that, and leave them down there uh, without us, uninterrupted, uh, to do the kind of research that we'd want to do over weeks or months. One of the coolest things about this is it has something called an optical modem, developed by my colleagues at Woods Hole Oceanographic. It's basically a laser, which you can see here in blue, uh, that allows us to talk to it at broadband speeds underwater. That is not what we can normally do. There's no Bluetooth underwater. There's no Wi-Fi. None of that exists. Do you know how we communicate from Alvin to the surface ship? We yell through the water. I'm not joking. There's a big microphone called a hydrophone, and we talk into it, and it literally yells our voices, and they hear it on the surface. But this optical modem allows us to transmit broadband data with a laser. And I'm going to set Lily up here and, and, and uh, say that this is what a photograph looks like. But one of the coolest things about Lily's depiction is it really kind of shaped my um, my thinking about what it would look like to be standing on the seafloor and actually looking at the abyss, right? 
Um, so yeah, at working with Pete, I began to get more and more inspired by the technology um, as opposed to just the organism. So the technology, in my mind, sort of represents our own relationship to them. And on our last cruise on the Falcor, I got inspired enough by the abyss to make a painting of it. Uh, but of course, I had to change my process a little bit. So I actually used the uh, manipulator arm of the remote operated vehicle to make a painting of the abyss. So uh, this is different from my usual technique. Uh, the pilots of the, of the ROV make it look really easy, and it's not. <laughs> So um, I, in case you're not familiar, we use uh, submarines like Alvin sometimes, and then often more and more we use remote operated vehicles. So this is the um, Schmidt vehicle, Sebastian, um, which is um, rated to an extraordinary depth, 4,500 meters or something. Um, and uh, so this is on deck, of course, but they let me, and I still can't believe they let me touch their multi-million dollar machine. It was like being handed the keys to a Porsche when you've never driven before. <laughs> um, so anyway, I made a painting of the Abyss Lander um, using this, this robot, which was pretty exciting. Um, and then the environment where we were deploying the lander was also really thrilling. Uh, it's another seep, so where methane and sulfur are seeping up slowly from the seafloor. And uh, the microbes at this seep um, turn, sort of leave behind this rock-like byproduct. And that's not uncommon, but usually it's a sort of flat rock. And at this particular site, they make these biomorphic three-dimensional formations that are um, really enchanting. So I, I, of course, got interested in painting that environment. So this is. One of the paintings that I made on the Nautilus ship of, of those formations. And there's, of course, the blue laser in the background, the optical modem. Um, and then this is the painting that I made, the version I made back in my studio, which is, again, on display <coughs> at Harvard. Uh, here's a view of all the, the paintings that you see in the museum here in my studio before I ship them out. So you get kind of a sense of of the scale. Um, and then Pete and I went back, of course, on the uh, Falcor to look uh, more extensively at this seep. It's called the Point Doom Seep. So this is the most recent painting I made. Um, and I made this painting on the ship. And again, um, this time I really got to study uh, the chimneys themselves because we weren't just looking at them with the ROV. We were collecting chunks of them. and. Uh, not keeping them alive, but keeping them in the lab in water to look at them. Um, and I'm going to turn this final slide over to Pete to discuss sort of, it's very um, clear to me uh, the impact that scientists like Pete have on my artwork and how much their research has informed my practice. But there is a, a sort of a feedback loop in which I have the opportunity to also um, inform Pete's work and his colleagues' work. And so I'm going to just let him speak to that. So it's at first glance, uh, for those of you who are here with us and uh, joining us uh, on Facebook Live, you've seen this beautiful, these beautiful uh, uh, renditions that Lily has created, right, that, that capture elements of, of these environments and these animals that are really hard to uh, imagine capturing with words or even photographs. One of the interesting things, though, is these paintings to me, it's like, it's like having an opportunity to look at something through someone else's eyes. And as a consequence, the things that Lily highlights actually have a scientific relevance. These features that you're looking at, when we first found them, they were sort of mounds on the seafloor. And we had a really hard time understanding exactly how that worked. And it tickles me to no end that as Lily started painting them, I began to look at the dark spots and thinking, there's fluid flow here. There's something coming out of the ground that's flowing up, and the microbes are building their sort of fairy, fairy tale castle around it. And it was a lot easier to see 
with Lily's representations, and honest to goodness, that fed straight back into our science and was the major driver for this last cruise we went on. And we went out equipped to actually look for fluid flow, and sure enough, we found it. Not by using the video camera, but by being inspired by Lily's paintings to literally look for the spots that cast shadows, and we were able then to sort of zoom in with our chemical sensors and actually, sure enough, establish that there's fluid flow. So indeed, right, this is just another example of how um, not only does the science perhaps inspire artists like Lily, but indeed her art inspired us, inspires us to look beyond what we see with our own eyes, right? It's a different kind of uh, lens, uh, and one that I think is um, not only enriches uh, our lives, but enriches uh, the science in ways that are just not easy to explain, um, but they're a lot easier to see. So now we're